Oh, you can't trust the press. They'll try. I know. Uh, I one know. there and one more out of yeah. here. This, we found out that that distant mic yeah. here yeah. for the tape, and if any of you needed the tape, uh, uh, you didn't. Uh, well, I told him so, I wasn't uh, going to answer. What about if I ask questions? <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> That's a switch. All right. Everybody's ready? Yeah. Mr. President, if I, if I could start it. Looking back over the past year, what did you do, what do you think you did wrong, and what would you have done differently? Well, I think there are always things that uh, you'll uh, think you did wrong. Uh, but uh, I think basically uh, we have continued on the path that we set uh, in 1981. Uh, the progress that we've made economically is, uh, is apparent. It is the first time in many years that we've had a recovery from a recession in which not only our, uh, is industrial, well, let's say just productivity increasing, uh, personal earnings increasing, inflation and unemployment both going down, all of these things happening at the same time. This, is, uh, this hasn't happened in a recovery for many, many years, which makes me believe we are on a firm footing for a, and have laid a foundation for a solid recovery. The, uh, that part is one. There are things, if, if you say, what should we have done differently? Well, there are things in trying to negotiate uh, bipartisan agreements on some of these. Uh, you look back and think, well, maybe if we'd worked harder in one direction or another, we got a, might have gotten more cooperation in our uh, need to reduce government spending. Uh, and the international uh, scene, I think that our uh, continued buildup of our, our strength uh, has uh, changed uh, international relations a, a great deal. I don't think without that uh, we would have had the uh, beginning negotiations that we've had in, uh, with regard to reduction of nuclear weapons, both the INF and the START talks. I think it is due to that. I think we've got a finer relationship than we've had for a long time with our own friends and allies. Uh, this is particularly true in uh, uh, the efforts that we've made uh, in Asia, as well as our longtime friends in, uh, in Europe. So all in all, uh, I think that there, there has been progress, but uh, it is a foundation laid for more progress. But, but if, if I could just, but surely, was there anything you went back at the end of the day and say, oh darn, I really, you know, that didn't work right, we should have done it. Is there any one thing that you can pick out? Oh, well, I probably, could get some in, incensed about, uh, uh, but this was before 1983, uh, the, earlier than that, uh, uh, going for the tax bill on the uh, assumption uh, uh, that uh, we'd been promised about $3 in reductions in spending for every dollar of tax revenue, and uh, we have never seen the $3 in reduced spending. Mr. President. Do you think the new rapprochement between uh, Arafat and uh, Mubarak now um, opens the way as a breakthrough for uh, the possibility of your peace plan getting moving and Hussein taking part? Well, Helen, I'm always a little, little leery about saying a breakthrough, but I do say, think this. We are optimistic about this because if you look at the, uh, the relationship there and the two country or the two peoples that were involved, uh, Mubarak is the head of state of the one country in the Arab world that has gone forward and has a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, we're hopeful that, uh, that the peace process will bring about more Arab nations uh, making their peace with Israel. Uh, obviously, a part of that process depends on a fair and just settlement of the Palestinian question. and. Uh, Arafat uh, has in the past, has been uh, one who has refused to recognize Israel's right to exist as a nation. But the fact that earlier and before this 
split in the PLO ranks, uh, he had begun to uh, discuss with uh, King Hussein uh, negotiations and participating in those negotiations on behalf of the Palestinians. Then that broke down with the split in the Palestinian movement. Now, I think that what uh, President Mubarak is doing is uh, talking to him about returning to where he was earlier, making contact with King Hussein, and getting those, those peace negotiations, our peace proposal, uh, underway again. Do you think there's a good chance? Yes, I do. I really do. We've, uh, because we had believed that settlement in Lebanon had to precede going further with that, I don't think that's necessarily true now. I think enough progress has been made there uh, that um, we can go forward with the, the peace movement. May, may I follow up, Mr. President? Israel has denounced the, the talks between Arafat and President Mubarak saying it was a clear violation of Camp David agreements. What do you respond to that? Well, I don't think it was a violation. And I, I think uh, I can understand their, uh, their feelings and view of a, the recent tragedy in Jerusalem and, and the group taking credit for that uh, claim to be a PLO group and all. But at the same time, I think as they look at this a little uh, more clearly, they will see that uh, Mubarak, uh, based on the experience of Egypt and its willingness to go forward uh, for peace, is simply trying to persuade others to change their thinking. There was one point uh, not too long before the peace treaty with Egypt in which Egypt was uh, uh, as violent in its hostility as, uh, as perhaps today the elements of the PLO are. And so who is better able to try and bring in another person into the peace process than someone who is who has made the change that Egypt has made. Do you think Mr. Arafat is still a popular leader among the Palestinians themselves? Well, this is what we need to find out. I can't believe that that radical group that under the influence of the Syrians uh, created this, all this tragedy around Tripoli, the innocent people that were killed because of the violence of that battle. I can't believe that the millions of Palestinians uh, are going to choose that leadership. Mr. President, on a slightly different subject, you mentioned that due to our arms buildup, that brought the Soviets to the negotiating table. And now we've had a breakdown in the arms talks, and there seems to be an increased level of tension. Do you think we're at a confrontation state with the Soviets, and is there any? No. And what do you see the chance of an arms accord in, in 1984? Well, we're going to keep on with that, and actually the Soviets have, have not said no. They've said they uh, wouldn't set a date yet for the resumption of these talks. On well, INF, they said they just walked out. On the INF talks, they just walked Yes, but out. since then there have been statements to the fact that uh, uh, they just uh, are not ready and they're unwilling at this point to set a date. I believe they will be back. And... Uh, I don't believe, I believe we're further from a confrontation possibility because of the deterrent capability of the United States and our allies at this point. I think there was a far more unstable condition when uh, we had let our own strength deteriorate to the point that there was a window of vulnerability. And I would like to call your attention to one thing. There have been 19 prior to this to our talks, there have been 19 efforts since World War II to engage the Soviet unions in talks about arms reduction. There has never been any progress made in those. Uh, the SALT talks actually were not arms reductions. They were uh, supposed to be setting a ceiling on how many more weapons would be built. And yet that has not been ratified, the SALT II treaty. But in these negotiations, even though uh, the Soviets were not as forthcoming as we would like to have had them be, 
they still did make uh, a couple of offers to reduce the number of their weapons. Now, that is the first time they have ever done that in any negotiations in all these previous 19 attempts. And uh, I think that now that they see that we are determined to maintain our own uh, ability to defend ourselves and, and our allies with us are, are included in that, um, I think that they have to see that these negotiations are in their interest as well as ours. Do you, do you have any signals that they are actually planning to come back, or are you just looking at it from your, what you see as common No, sense? I think the things that we have heard. I, I think that this is, uh, you might say, almost a part of the negotiating process. Their, their whole uh, uh, principal move uh, over this last year or so has been an effort to stop the deployment of the intermediate range weapons that were asked for by NATO. And the fact that we are going ahead, this maybe could still, that could be tied to that as still, you might say, an element of negotiating. But uh, we are going to proceed with the installation of those weapons. You don't think it's three minutes to 12, a doomsday clock? The scientists seem to think so. Well, and they think it's a more dangerous world now. Well, maybe the scientists know more about science, and, uh, uh, and from the standpoint of the power of the weapons, yes, they are more powerful, they are more destructive on both sides than they were before. And maybe looking at it from a scientist's viewpoint, uh, that moves up their doomsday clock. But uh, they're not involved in the uh, diplomatic and political end of this, as we and are. Sir, you only have three, really three minutes now to make a decision on war and peace in the nuclear, according to the nuclear scientists, there would be three minutes on each side. Well, now, Helen, uh, in the Bible, weren't we told that a uh, that, uh, long period of time was only a moment or even a second uh, to God? Uh, I don't know whether they're, what their three minutes refers to. Uh, I know it doesn't refer you to three minutes. it would minutes. be a lot longer for you to decide? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, on their doomsday clock, each minute on that clock, is that weeks, is that months, is that years uh, uh, that they're, and they've never said of what it is. But no, I believe that actually, and I can understand their, their feeling, all, the, uh, all that they hear, and uh, forgive me, but a lot of the editorial content is that, oh, there are great tensions. There has been, uh, let's say, uh, more uh, heat in rhetoric. There has not been more heat in the actual relationship. At the time that the rhetoric was being used from both sides, our negotiators were sitting there at the table negotiating. Mr. President, can I come back on the prospects of these talks, these arms talks? Uh, there's a lot of concern, especially in Europe, that with the lack of dialogue between the West and the East, especially as, as the U.S is entering uh, an election year. Uh, if, if you run for re-election, the, the Soviets are not likely to help you. And so how, how, how do you see an, uh, the prospects for some kind of an agreement before the elections? Well, I would hope that the Soviet Union would remember their failure in trying to influence the German election and decide not to go down that road again. But as far as I am concerned, uh, whoever our candidate may be, uh, I don't think any decisions on a subject of this kind should be made on our, on our part, on our side, on the basis of, as I said the other night, of political considerations. We are going to continue to do everything we can to resume and achieve arms reductions, as sizable as we can make them and ultimately, I would hope, total elimination of nuclear weapons. They have no real place in a civilized world. The goal is peace. And I have been a little disturbed by the tendency of so many in this country to uh, seem to feel that somehow uh, we're at fault when they are the ones 
who left the table without setting a date for return. So you're not going to make any proposal before oh, I come back? Oh, we are in communication. We haven't broken off communications. We're not, as we've been portrayed, that the two superpowers are here separated with no contact at all. No, we're in communication with them. And we want to continue uh, these, these policies that, uh, that, are lead, that would lead toward reduction of arms and would re lead toward peace. I am prepared to say, if the Soviet government wants peace, there will be no war. Because I don't know, I know for a fact that no other country wants war with the Soviet Union. The ball is really in their court. If they want peace, they can have it. And isn't that, though, what's kept the peace, this mutual terror? I think the deterrent capability, yes. This is, see, we have, a, we have a weapon here in the world today, the nuclear weapon, that for the first time in the history of all man's weapons has never resulted in a defensive weapon being created against it. The only thing we have is deterrence. The only thing we have is the knowledge that that on either that on both sides the punishment would be uh, more than any nation could afford. Uh, if they started it, uh, they would have to be prepared to accept virtually as much punishment as they were administering. And this has kept the peace. I've had some meetings with young people who've brought this very subject up, and they're greatly concerned. And uh, I've asked them a question, and I must say they come up with a pretty sound answer. I've said, we're the only ones that has ever used a nuclear weapon in Japan in World War II. Would we have used that weapon if we knew they also had that weapon and could use it back against us? And without fail, every group I've ever said this to has decided that no, we would never have used the weapon. So that's Mr. the real deterrent to war. Yes. Yeah. Mr. President, uh, in Central America recently there have been some apparently conciliatory gestures from Nicaragua. Do you think these are sincere moves or are they propaganda ploys and do you intend any response to them? I think that there is more they can do than they've done. It's, um, I think the situation with them right now is uh, covered by the words of Demosthenes in the Athenian marketplace 2,000 years ago when he said, what man would let another man's words rather than his deeds tell him who is at peace and who is at war with him? So you, you don't think there are too much of these uh, no, gestures then? We've made it plain. and we've There again, there's been contact. And as uh, our Ambassador Stone has made it plain to them that all they have to do is reinstitute the principles of their own revolution, the things that they promised the people they were going to bring about if their revolution succeeded. And they have not done that. They betrayed their own revolution and created a totalitarian state. Well, if you turn Demosthenes around, might the people of Managua not say, we want to see some deeds from the United States? Well, what hostile deeds have they seen? The uh, uh, they think of Grenada, for one. Maybe we think. Maybe you think it was a very benign. Oh, rebel I think forces fight preparing to, well, to invade. Uh, but those rebel forces are part of their own original revolution. The people that once they succeeded were ousted uh, because they wanted to institute the democratic policies. But they're being armed by us. But uh, uh, well, we set out after the revolution succeeded, prior to my administration. The previous administration immediately started to come to the financial aid, economic aid, to the Sandinista government until it found out that the Sandinista government was not keeping the promise of its revolution and the aid was withdrawn. Now, to, to invoke Grenada, uh, here again, I think the words of the Grenadian people themselves, the Governor General, the people of Grenada, the peop our own people who were there and who were rescued, 
have revealed this was not an invasion. This was something of the nature of a commando operation. And it was a rescue mission. And the people of Grenada have made it very plain that they feel that they too were rescued. And the fact that uh, we have withdrawn our combat troops so precipitously that uh, some of the Grenadians are a little alarmed that they don't think we should have left yet. Mr. President, have you seen the Pentagon report yet or do you know anything about it? It's uh, so critical. It has it. finally been delivered over here. It's not, right. it hasn't reached me it as yet. It has not been briefed no. at all on it? No, just uh, It sounds devastating. Well, I'm not going to comment any, until I you see don't it. don't really have any idea what's in it. Uh, no more than I read in the papers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you think that a lot of people are going to suffer from it? I just, Helen, I just can't comment until I see it. We, we've all heard that it, that it in some way criticizes everyone in the chain of command. Do you, philosophically or anyway, feel that that chain of command is, you're at the top of it in this case, and, and you, you bear some of that responsibility? Well, there's no way to, uh, to uh, discount responsibility. As commander-in-chief, uh, uh, the operation could not have gone forward without my approval. And uh, so in that sense, I think that the investigation was being uh, very thorough. The, Yes, there would have been no mission without my, uh, my decision to go forward with it. Mr. President, in Lebanon, uh, President Pertini of Italy today called for withdrawal of the Italian contingent of the multinational force. Uh, apparently, there have been 15 countries who were asked to join that force and who have refused. Uh, are you not concerned that uh, the United States, by siding with Israel, is going to end up alone in, in Lebanon? No, I think that there was a, a not completely a thorough statement of uh, our meeting with Prime Minister Shamir. Uh, it was portrayed, and many people saw it, as somehow arriving at some new uh, coalition with them, and uh, even the word conspiracy was used by some in there. But. Uh, no, there was a reaffirmation by us of what our relationship with Israel has been since 1948. And we discussed this not from any standpoint of Israel and its relationship with Arab countries in the sense of uh, taking their part uh, in, in anything of that kind. We're dedicated to the idea of trying, if we can, to act as a friend to both the Arab states and Israel in settling those long-time disputes and bringing about the kind of peace that we find between Egypt and Israel now. Do you think a UN force would be better in there? I would have wished from the very first for a UN force. But what has prevented it? The Soviet Union veto. If you look at the UNIFIL force that is presently in the south of Lebanon, it is so bound by restrictions that were imposed uh, as in order to get uh, the Soviet Union vote, that it literally is helpless to do anything. It isn't that these people are ineffective or that they aren't capable. So then they, they are couldn't restricted. possibly be replaced. Well, I could, we could st I could still hope mm -hmm. that the Soviet Union now uh, would recognize the value of having a, a UN force in there. And uh, as I say, we would have preferred this from the very first, but it was something that couldn't be obtained. But. Where was I on? No, I, was, I was asking, weren't you concerned, aren't you concerned oh, about the, the growing reluctance of your allies to assume part of the... Well, in we have been in communication, and I think that they understand better now, because we were just as forthright in talking to Prime Minister Shamir about our intentions of, in our dealings with the Arab states and the things that we were going to do in, uh, in linkage with them. All of this aimed at uh, being able, if uh, a mediator is, can be of use in that peace process that we proposed, to ensure a fair solution uh, to the problems. We have no plan that we're going to impose. That would be wrong of us to go in and say, here is the peace plan. It must be negotiated out. On one side, there is territory. On the other side, there can be assurances of security. And someplace there has to be a balance 
in there in which uh, one is traded for the other. But that is up to them to negotiate. And uh, I think uh, our meeting with the uh, uh, foreign minister of, of Egypt, my own personal communication with uh, President Mubarak, uh, other communications that we have made, straightening out what the situation was and what uh, what our relationship with Israel is and uh, what we want in a relationship with them. And uh, I don't think, I think it, there was some discomfort at first. I don't think so anymore. But, but, it, but doesn't, is there any concern that 15 other allied nations are asked to join this force and have, have backed out? Or ah, but you're going back. Remember when, I think this was back when we were putting it together. We were trying to get forces that would join in it. Well, now there could be a number of reasons why a nation wouldn't. There could be the very fact of cost that to some nations. And remember, uh, this recession has been worldwide. Um, so whatever the reasons were, but this was back when we were trying to put the multinational force together. And I think the very fact that uh, the United Kingdom, that Italy, France, the United States, were able to provide what we thought was an adequate force uh, for the purpose we had in mind. We've got four true and false questions. Is Jean Kirkpatrick leaving? <laughs> yes or no? No, Jean came in, came in as she has uh, every year. Will you go for a summit? What? Will you go for a summit if the Soviets propose it? Uh, well, I've always been willing to go if there is a possibility of accomplishing something. And what do you want to happen next year? I want the I want the recovery to continue. I want us to achieve more control over spending. And therefore, I would hope that the press would reveal to the people of this country how valuable line item veto line item <laughs> veto could be in the helping to get control over we'll tell extravagance. Them. And what would be a new budget proposal. And I would hope that we would be far more advanced toward peace and toward a reduction of nuclear weapons. And a new tax. What? A new tax. Uh, I would hope that uh, that wouldn't be necessary. Thank you. Do you have a New Year's resolution? Uh, He's leaving, so I can defy him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, New Year's resolution. resolution. <laughs> don't make no, them. No, I don't. I've. I, I don't think I've bothered with one of those for a long time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Happy New Year. And Jim, Merry thank Christmas. You. Merry Christmas to you. Andy, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. I think I'm wired here. Yeah, you better. Now, <laughs> you'll get that tape edited down to everything. <laughs> Censored. Not at all. Are you looking forward now to the holidays and having a good time? Yes. Christmas here, New Year's. You really have been busy. You have a lot better while. weather out there than we've had the past two years. It's been kind of... Uh, yes, well, and right now, let's keep your fingers crossed because there's a storm coming in you know, off the coast. So let's hope that it will get going. Like this yeah. weekend <laughs> and the next weekend will be right. Right. I've never been to Palm Springs yet, but what has been cold. Yeah, it can get very cold. Well, Did you last... call Dean Kelly? Did you call no, but I sent him a wire. Terrible, huh? Now, that was a, and what a miracle it was, the way you said. Uh, uh, I've heard the story about it from, from someone out there. How his son, son got burned, the whole the main staircase going upstairs to wake his father uh -huh. was uh, uh, on fire. On fire, and he got burned, but he took his father and his sister down a, a back stairway and got them out, but the whole house by that time was gone. Uh -huh. He had left the Christmas tree lights on all night for people that might be going by. Thought it would be nice to let them see the cheerful lights. Well, we're the one. Who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? I can't talk about those the things. California now. Team. You got three California teams. <laughs> Thank you. I know. I got to be. I got to be down the middle on this. <laughs>